Hello and welcome to this Unit 5 video lecture. This lecture is meant to introduce you to Herodotus and his history. We will be looking at portions of Herodotus's history, his inquiries as he called them, in Unit 5. So we'll begin by noting the time frame that most scholars have pinpointed Herodotus as living, roughly from 484 to 425. And Herodotus is living at a time of great political upheaval, of great intellectual fermentation, and he is very much influenced by the intellectual and literary trends that are then developing, particularly in Athens. Now, Herodotus was not native to Athens. He makes it clear he comes from a place called Halicarnassus, which, as you can see from the Black Arrow, is located along that strip of coastal Anatolia, which the Greeks referred to as Ionia. So Halicarnassus places Herodotus during his formative years along the borderland between east and west. And this is going to be a key feature of how Herodotus interprets events. And he is ideally placed to be as close as we can get to an impartial observer as he explores the epic conflict between East and West, the Greco-Persian Wars. So on Herodotus as historian, uh, first of all, we should recognize that historia means research or inquiry. Nowhere does myth appear in this particular definition. So Herodotus is signaling that his intellectual endeavor will seek out the root causes of historical events through interviews and through his own analysis. Now, right at the very beginning of his work, Herodotus makes very clear that this conflict, uh, like all wars and conflicts, has been brought about because of the actions of people. Indeed, in his opening paragraph, Herodotus specifies his intention to recount the deeds and actions of, as he phrases it, Greeks and barbarians, uh, the term barbarian meaning foreigner in Greek. And when Herodotus writes that he wants to record the great and astonishing deeds by Greeks and foreigners, it signals his intention to frame his history, his inquiry, as a type of epic uh, to confer kleos, uh, glory, on its heroes. So Herodotus you know, is, in a way, modeling himself on the Homeric framework, of heroic deeds without uh, the more mythical aspects of the uh, older epics. The gods are very much left out of Herodotus' story as an influential force, with the exception of the Delphic Oracle. The Oracle at Delphi was a temple sacred to Apollo, where Greeks and non-Greeks consulted the Delphic Oracle to seek guidance whenever a matter of great importance had to be decided. And, of course, the trick was to correctly interpret the prophecy that was given by the Pythia, the priestess, and that was not always an easy task. For example, uh, King Croesus of Lydia falls victim to a dramatic misinterpretation of what the Delphic Oracle has told him when he asks if it would be wise to attack the advancing Persian army. The Delphic Oracle replies, if Croesus goes to war, he will destroy a great empire. So Croesus, ever the optimist, attacks the Persians and is defeated and winds up destroying his own empire. And this tragedy for Croesus is also an example of the philosophical or didactic component of Herodotus' history, where you could learn from other people's mistakes. And initially, this was a very strong and long-enduring trend in the genre of written histories, that somehow history should be philosophy that teaches by actual example, by actual historical events, that allow us to learn from other people's decisions and their mistakes. So that type of didactic function is present throughout his history. And Herodotus, like many historians, was very much interested in how societies are composed 
and how they respond to crisis. So, despite many digressions, Herodotus takes as his main topic the wars between the Greeks and the Persian Empire. And he frames this conflict as a type of dichotomy, implying that this series of wars between Greek and Persian is actually part of a bigger struggle, East versus West, that there is a cultural incompatibility that is bound to lead to conflict between these two areas of the world. And although Herodotus tries to minimize his bias, it becomes evident that he believes that Greek freedom and all of Greek culture is far better than the Eastern monarchical type of despotism that is referenced when he describes the successive reigns of the kings of Persia, Cyrus, Cambyses, Darius, and especially Xerxes. Regarding these kings and monarchy in general, Herodotus makes it clear that the rule of one individual is bound to lead to what the Greeks referred to as hubris, a dangerous, overweening pride. It is often called the pride that comes before the fall. Indeed, if we imagine each one of these Persian kings as a protagonist in a Greek tragedy, we will see how each one of these kings falls victim to what the philosopher Aristotle called hamartia, an error in judgment that is often brought about by hubris. This connection between history and the genre of tragedy is no surprise given that Herodotus was crafting his history in Athens during the great cultural flowering that was taking place. So scholars have long noted the resemblance of some of the stories in Herodotus' history to Greek tragedy. Certain passages seem to resemble the standard structure of an actual Greek tragedy. There are even some verbal echoes of Herodotus in the great tragedian Sophocles, which again is no surprise given that ancient tradition says that Herodotus and Sophocles were actual friends. There are nine books or chapters within Herodotus's history. And as you can see from this brief outline, Herodotus is wide ranging and touches on a number of different cultures. Book one will outline the beginnings of the East-West conflict, and Herodotus does really conceptualize the Greco-Persian Wars as part of a broader conflict between Eastern cultures and Western cultures, Asia and Europe. And Herodotus believes that this long-standing situation was exacerbated from time to time by feuds triggered when one side abducted a woman from the other side. Uh, for example, Queen Helen of Sparta, representing Europe or the West, is abducted by Paris, Prince of Troy, who represents the East or Asia. Herodotus then moves through to Croesus, King of Lydia, who Herodotus describes as being the first Eastern monarch to do harm to the Greeks in general, and then he looks at what happens to Croesus with the rise of Cyrus, the founder of what becomes known as the Persian Empire. Book two covers a lengthy ethnographic study of Egyptian civilization, and he's covering Egypt in part because Cyrus's son Cambyses, who will become king of the Persians, will conquer Egypt and bring it into the expanding Persian Empire. In Book 3, Herodotus covers the mysterious death of Cambyses and how Darius, somebody not directly related to Cambyses, will then take the Persian throne. In Book 4, Herodotus describes in great detail Darius's military campaign against the Scythians, a nomadic people located in what is today the Ukraine and southern Russia. This campaign does not go well for the Persians, and Herodotus explores it in some detail. In Book 5, we begin to get into the immediate causes of the Greco-Persian Wars, and this has to do with the Ionian Revolt. Ionia, as by now you're well aware of, 
was that area of coastal Anatolia, that area that had been Greek, but Croesus, king of Lydia, had conquered it, and then Croesus, in turn, had been conquered by Cyrus during the early round of Persian conquests. And so Ionia goes from being Greek to being a Lydian holding to being a Persian satrapy, a, a Persian province. And several decades of Persian rule will make the Ionians yearn for something better. And ultimately, they will revolt against the Persians, and that will trigger a broader conflict between the Persian Empire and the mainland Greek city-states like Athens and Sparta, and this will result in two Persian attacks on mainland Greece. In Book 6, Herodotus describes in detail the first military strike by the Persians against the Greek mainland, and this will culminate in 490 BCE with the epic Battle of Marathon, one of the great underdog stories in all of military history. Books 7 through 9 focus on a second round of Persian invasions of Greece in 480 BCE, this time led by Xerxes, the son of Darius. So that's the overall structure of the nine books, and because we will be reading portions of Herodotus's history, I wanted to give you an overview of the broader scope of this work. And so, in conclusion, I want to leave you all with the image of Herodotus as an enthusiastic reporter of the events of his time, able to tell a very good story, but cognizant that the genre he was creating must do more than entertain. It must teach. It must guide. It must shape our ability to navigate a complex and sometimes very dangerous world.